welcome to the next installment in the video series Deep Dives, where we take a deep look at something you thought you may have already understood. A disclaimer, from a mathematician standpoint, these are not especially deep, they're really just meant to serve as an introduction to some topics that maybe you'll find interesting. And in this video, we're going to learn what the word dimension means to a mathematician. So when it comes to the word dimension, the first time most of us hear this is in the context of Euclidean space. So for example, the real number line is a one dimensional line. The plane or r to the second power can be viewed as a two dimensional plane. And r to the third power is three dimensional space and so forth. So we can ask what happens if we just keep going. So the number of dimensions in this sort of understanding of Euclidean space has to do with what are called degrees of freedom. In the plane, for example, up and down are not independent of one another. Moving up is the same thing as anti-moving down. But up, down, and left, right are independent. You can move up, down, or you can move left, right, and you can do both, and they don't interact with one another depending on your degree of physical coordination. So motion in one direction doesn't actually affect the other one. So the number of directions in which you can move that don't interact with one another is sort of an intuitive way of understanding what dimension is. Now the formal basis for this is in linear algebra, specifically the word basis. So without going into a review of linear algebra, a basis of a vector space is a collection of objects from that vector space so that no member can be expressed as a combination of other ones and everything in your space can be expressed as a finite combination of things from your collection. So one object cannot be made from finitely many of the others, but everything can be made from finitely many of those objects. So let's talk about Euclidean space. The standard basis is the two points or vectors, and I'm gonna muddy the waters here and conflate them, but the point one zero and zero one. You can't express one zero as a multiple of 0, 1, the vertical unit. But every point in space x, y is x horizontal units and y vertical units. So the two objects cannot be expressed in terms of one another, but everything in the plane can be expressed in terms of those two objects. That makes it a basis. Now there were two elements of this basis. So we say that the space is two-dimensional. It is a fact that in a vector space any two bases have to have the same quantity of elements, but we're not going to get into that. Okay, so here is a point on a line. It can move from left to right, so we've got this one degree of freedom. We've got a one-dimensional space. What about a two-dimensional plane? It can move up down but what else can it do? It can move right and left, and it can do a combination of those motions. So it can move a combination of right and up or down and left or whatever. It has this two-dimensional sort of wandering ground it can move about in. So here is my best attempt at drawing a three-dimensional representation. We can move along this direction, right, left, we can move along this direction up down, but now there's this direction that we imagine coming out of the screen towards you. It can move along that too. And just as in the planar example, you can do a sort of combination of all of them. But if we let go of the idea that dimension has to mean something we can visualize with our brains, then we can totally consider spaces that have more than three dimensions. In fact, there is no requirement that you have a finite number of dimensions. So long as you can construct infinitely many objects that cannot be made from one another, you'll have a space that has infinite dimension. Now, the classic example of an infinite dimensional vector space is the space of polynomials with certain coefficients, for example, real valued coefficients. So a polynomial is a sum of finitely many terms, some real number times x to a power, x to the zero power for the constant term, x to the first up to, a finite stopping point of x to the nth power. But there's no restriction on how large it can be. n, this last term, x to the n, does have to exist. It does have to stop, but it could be as large as you want. So therefore, you cannot make a finite collection of polynomials that can express all of them, because any finite collection of polynomials would have a largest power in it, and then you would be unable to get larger powers through multiplication by constants and adding them to one another.
So therefore, the space of polynomials is infinite dimensional. There is no finite collection of polynomials that can act as a basis. But dimension can be even bigger than infinite. The set of continuous functions of the compact interval from 0 to 1, for example, cannot be spanned even by a countably infinite collection of functions. There is a dense countable subset in this space, but that doesn't make it a basis. So any vector space has a basis, as long as we're taking the axiom of choice, so put an asterisk there if that's something you really care about. Any basis for this space cannot even be countably infinite, must be uncountably infinite. But that's not the only way we can think about dimension. Suppose you have an interval of length L and you make it twice as long, so its length is now 2 times L. Hooray! But if you have a rectangle of width w and length l, its area is the product of the two, w times l. So what happens if you double each of those measurements? Well, now you have 2w width and 2l length, and the product is now 4wl. So doubling the measurements, width and length, actually made your area four times as large. If you have a three-dimensional box that also has a height and you double that, you will now have a box that's twice as large in every dimension, but its volume got multiplied by two to the third, or eight. So this observation can kind of generalize. If you have an object of positive n-dimensional measure, if it's scaled by a factor k, then its measure will scale by a factor of k to the n. The dimension is the exponent used here. So doubling, for example, would be k equals 2. So if I scale everything by k, I double, that makes it 2. In one dimension, you just double. You multiply by 2 to the first. But in two dimensions, it gets scaled by 2 squared, or 4. And in three dimensions, 2 cubed, or 8. So we can sort of think of dimension another way. We can say the dimension of an object is the exponent we would have to put on how the size of the object changes if we scale everything by a factor k. So if scaling by k changes the size of the object by k to the alpha, then it is alpha dimensional. It is possible for this alpha to not be a whole number. So consider this Sierpinski gasket formed by removing the middle triangle from a starting triangle. So here is a triangle. I remove the middle triangle, and what I now have are three triangles. If I remove their middles, I now have nine triangles, and I can remove their middles, and I can keep going. And if you just keep going and going and going and take a limit as the number of iterations goes to infinity, you get a shape kind of like this. But here's the same shape, twice as large in every direction. Okay, It is twice as wide, it is twice as high, but it is also now a triangle formed by removing the middles over and over and over. But I scaled everything by a factor of two and I got more or less the same shape. But it's made of three copies of the original. Here's one, a second, and a third. So doubling the size of this object meant there were exactly three copies of the original. So I have my gasket on the left and it's doubling on the right and it is three copies of the original. So doubling all the measurements made it three times the original size. Now three is two to the log base two of three. This is just properties of how logarithms and exponents interact. So does that mean doubling scaled it by a factor of three or two to the log base two of three? So the exponent, when I scaled by two that I put on two in order to understand how the size changed, was this non-integer number log base two of three. So is that the dimension of this figure, about 1.585? So there are many ways to compute these non-integer or fractional dimensions. And the most common way that people start looking at these fractional dimensions is how this exponent interacts with scaling. And we first learn to compute this through what's called the Minkowski dimension, or the box counting dimension, or minkowski bugalan dimension. And I apologize for probably mispronouncing every name that I'm going to say in this entire video. So for a set that lives in n-dimensional Euclidean space, suppose capital N of epsilon is the number of squares, cubes, or hypercubes, or whatever, of side length epsilon, so in two-dimensional space you would have an epsilon by epsilon square, in three-dimensional space an epsilon by epsilon by epsilon cube, and so forth. Let n of epsilon be how many of those is needed to totally cover the set. 
the Minkowski dimension is computed by taking a limit as epsilon approaches zero from above of minus log of this quantity over log of epsilon. So look at our Sierpinski gasket. Suppose the original happens to fit in a one by one square. So here is our yellow one by one square. It also fits in three squares of length one half or nine of length one quarter and so forth. So for every epsilon equals one over two to the n, one, one half, one quarter, and so forth, we found that we had to triple the number of boxes. So n of epsilon is three to the n. Now we're setting aside all possible values of epsilon and just focusing on one over two to the n. So if I just look along this subsequence of epsilons and I look at the limit as epsilon approaches zero from above of this ratio of n of epsilon over log of epsilon, then we end up with a dimension of log base two of three. There are other dimensions other than Minkowski dimension, and probably other than upper and lower box counting mention, I would say the most common that's used is what's called Hausdorff dimension. Uh, there are many, many other different, slightly different variations on dimension, upper box dimension, lower box dimension, for example, if this limit doesn't exist, but has a limb soup and limb inf. And the same set can actually have different dimensions depending on how it's defined. We won't get into examples of that, but it's definitely possible. So the standard way that you can learn about this topic of objects of fractional dimension, AKA fractals, is the book Fractal Geometry, Mathematical Foundations and Applications by Kenneth Falconer. It's the standard undergrad friendly way to get into this topic.